Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 32 through 35. I invite you to listen for the word. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have been a pastor for almost 23 years now. And throughout my entire ministry, I've seen a legion of formulas, gimmicks, expensive pre-packaged programs, all promising the same thing, a return. A return of your investment in the results of church growth. Always defined by what we now call the two B's. Butts in the pews and bucks in the plant. These programs promised a return to the church in its former glory. And they've had many names over the years. When I started in ministry, they were referred to as redevelopment and revitalization. The most recent terminology I've seen is vitality and cultivating. But regardless of what language is used, these programs continue to lure us in with a promise. Churchtopia. Of all the programs that have come and gone in the past two decades, the one that makes made me cringe the most was called the Acts 4 Church. The program used today's passage as its results and said that if we return to acting like the early church acted in Acts, we too could return to this beautiful moment, the Church of Acts 4. Camelot moment. People were being drawn in by the thousands and everyone got along with each other and there was always enough, especially of those two bees. Many congregations signed on to become an Acts 4 church. There were even bumper stickers you could buy to proudly claim your church was an Acts 4 church. And yet the Acts 4 program fizzled. And many congregations still struggle with the same problems as before. And so the only return that many of these programs actually provided was a sense of guilt. Why aren't we like the Acts for church? What are we doing wrong? One reason for this is that the Acts 4 church, as we imagine it with these few verses, never actually existed. This short passage may be a snapshot in time, but it is only one image, and it doesn't tell the whole story any more than does the old photo from a church's glory days when it had a kindergarten that was bursting at the seams. Oh, that looks great, until you find out the reason for that highly successful program was because people did not want to send their children to integrated schools in the 60s in the South. The picture of the perfect church in Acts 4 is actually an image of something that was never real, a churchtopia. Now it may seem strange to be in the book of Acts immediately after Easter Sunday, 
We have the great 50 days of Easter to celebrate. And this, yes, this means you can leave your Easter decorations up, by the way. But we have 50 days of Easter before we get to Pentecost. So why are we not only in Acts, but in the post-Pentecost Acts? This book is about the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Who, if we follow chronological order, supposedly has not arrived yet. But this passage is here. And it is here for a reason. Because Easter and Pentecost are connected to each other. Acts is about the fulfillment of the resurrection promise that Christ will be with them. Without the resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit would not have been received. And what we see in Acts is how the apostles and early believers tried to live out the resurrection hope. And how they continued on with Christ's mission, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, and proclaiming the good news. So, let's return to Acts 4. As I said, we have lifted this little passage out of the rest of the story, and we've turned it into a formula for churchtopia. And in doing so, we don't see what else is going on. Read the book of Acts sometimes. There was infighting over who was in charge. There was controversy over who should be responsible for what. We will see schisms, fights over who's allowed into this community of faith and who is not, arguments over what it means to be faithful. We will see moments when greed takes over. All of which shows us that the early church was not immune to the same struggles we have now. So then, why focus on this little passage at all? Why not just ignore it? If this early group of gatherers was no different from us, what is the point of this snapshot except to make us feel guilty that we have not been able to create such a churchtopia? Luke tells us that the people, for one brief shining moment, were the church. Small case C, by the way, the institution doesn't exist yet. They were of one heart and soul. So in this little moment, Churchtopia did exist. Not because of numbers. Not because of slick promises and programs, but because for one moment the people were actually one. Now being of one heart and soul was not about uniformity. It didn't mean that everybody looked the same, acted the same, dressed the same, liked the same things, disliked the same things. It didn't mean everybody liked the same worship style or the same songs. It didn't mean everyone could suddenly agree on the color carpet for the sanctuary and whether paving the parking lot should be a spiritual goal for the year. It's not what it meant. Although that is another way that this passage has been used to say that if we don't all agree all the time, then there's something wrong with it. And that kind of focus on the passage also misses the point. It's not about everyone being nice to each other. It's not even about everyone sharing everything they had with each other. Something greater than even charity is surging through this passage. Yes, believers are living out a commitment to belong to one another. And they recognize they must address the impediments to doing so. And as Willie James Jennings puts it, money here, money in this passage, 
Money here will be used to destroy what money is usually used to create distance and boundaries between people. More importantly, this passage offers a stunning display, not of mutual concern, but of mutual identity. An identity formed in Christ and his new life. To be of one heart and soul meant that these believers actually, on occasion, lived out the resurrection life of hope and love. Their focus was on that, that message, that mission. It's what they strove to do, and because of that, great grace was upon them all. It's never about creating a church topia. To reduce the testimony of Acts, as a, to, as this Acts 4 in particular, to a checklist of behaviors is to miss what great grace entails. But to receive it as a testimony of how God's resurrection power animates the life of the church that opens possibilities for faithful response. And that is what this passage calls us to in the present day. Faithful response. We are called to remember the resurrection hope and to focus ourselves on it, not because it promises us solutions to our struggles, but because this passage shows us what resurrection practices look like in a communal context. It shows us how the church lives together as it continues and amplifies the ministry of the risen Christ. When we focus on that, then we too can be of one heart and soul caring for those in need, feeding the hungry, and proclaiming the good news. Because just in case you didn't catch it, the one heart and soul, it's not my heart and soul. It's not your heart and soul. It is Christ's heart and soul. That is the good news. It also means that we can let go of our ever-present need for results. That constant yearning we have to finally create churchtopia. That's not what we've been called to do. Ever. We have been called to a community of mutual care and concern but more importantly, we have been called to continue the mission of the resurrection hope of love and grace. And in that way, we can be an Acts 4 church, a community that breaks bread together and engages in practices of formation. We can be the community that strives and struggles as it continues to break down the barriers that the world tries to throw up and to reach out to others, not because we want their butts in our pews, but because we know it's what Christ would do. Of one heart and soul. We can engage in the ministries of mercy and justice, of communal care and mission when we keep our focus on what the resurrection hope calls us to be, well, then we are an Acts church. And there will be moments of churchtopia, moments where great grace does something we never could have done on our own. And people will, to quote our upcoming song, know we are Christians by our love. Amen. Um,